this is Tim McLaughlin with a few minutes of Erie, Pennsylvania history. I'd like to talk a little bit about a subject that's uh, near and dear to me, uh, which is Mark's Toy Works. I had Mark's Toys when I was a kid. They had army men, soldiers, uh, toy pistols and guns. Uh, Little did I know that I would work there uh, in the 1970s when I got up high, first got up high school. Uh, I went uh, to work at Mark's Toy Works. Uh, they hired uh, long-haired hippies, uh, some of my friends. Uh, there was Nino Gennaro, you know, and uh, Tim Driscoll. He was a jitney driver. Uh, they all worked there. Well, Lewis Marks, the founder of Mark's Toy Works, uh, he's not even from Erie. He was born in Brooklyn, New York in 1894. He was a smart, enterprising young man. He starts this company with his brother in 1919. Uh, by the age of 26, uh, he's a millionaire. And this is just three years after he started Mark's Toy Works. When most companies were struggling during the Great Depression, Mark's Toy Works, his revenue actually increased. Now, Lewis Marks, he didn't invent the yo-yo, uh, but he sold over 100 million yo-yos in the 1920s. Amazing. Now, Lewis Marks, uh, he had several manufacturing plants, but in Erie, Pennsylvania, it was the first one, it was the largest one, and it was actually the oldest one, too. Well, little did I know, growing up in the 1950s and playing with all these great Marks toys, they were the largest manufacturer of toys in the world. And so I graduated from Strong Vincent High School in 1971, and I need a job, I want to get a job and make some money, so I apply up at Marks Toy Works, I get the job, and I'm a trucker on the line. And what a trucker does on the line is make sure that the women doing the assembly work, that they don't run out of parts and they always need glue and you have to get them glue and parts. It was really kind of a strange place to work when you see these uh, Mickey Mouses and you know their heads are going on these overhead conveyor belts and people are drilling holes <laughs> where their eyes are to put in other eyes, you know. It's just kind of strange to see all of this. I initially started at the 12th Street plant, and then eventually, uh, I believe the next year, I went up to the 18th Street plant. And some of the things they were making were Rock'em Sock'em robots. They were making the Mark's Big Wheel. That was always popular. I didn't realize that I was 11 years old when they came out with the Rock'em Sock'em robots. It's 1964, and they're still making it in 1971. Uh, I also worked on the Chopperoo. The Chopperoo was basically a big wheel, but it had those big, uh, what they called, monkey handlebars that went way up high and the seat was slung way back. They were still making army stuff, you know, like plastic helmets, and they were making you know, the guns, western guns and military type rifles. But that Mark's big wheel, that was super popular. It was only introduced just a couple of years before I started working there. It actually went into the National Toy Hall of Fame. Well, in 1972, there's this paint crew that I see. They're coming around and they're painting these old iron stanchions. And this is factory is old and it just looks old. It's hard to paint something like that and make it look new. I was curious why they were painting the place. And I asked some people and they said, oh, well, it, they're trying to make a deal with Quaker Oats. And Quaker Oats eventually did buy Mark's Toy Works. And you're wondering, well, why would Quaker Oats buy Mark's Toy Works. Well, they already owned Fisher Price Toys, and they thought that that would be a good mix having Quaker Oats, uh, Fisher Price Toys, and Mark's Toys. Well, Lewis Marks, he sells it for $54 million. Now, in today's money, that's $350 million. Well, by the early 1980s, Marks closes. I mean, there was a competition from overseas and there was a trend for a lot of electronic toys back then and not so much for the old plastic ones. Well, there's so many stories I could tell about working there. Uh, in the back room, way in the back of the factory, there was this huge container of balls that, you know, just plastic balls that must have been left over from some baseball game or something. And you could jump in this and totally cover yourself. And Little did we know that that was basically a ball pit. Well, the place was loaded with cardboard boxes everywhere. So we made kind of a secret trucker's lounge in the back with, you know, blocks, chairs, and you, you had a secret way to get in, and you could just disappear if you needed to get away for a little bit. Well, I could go on and on about stories about the place. Uh, but my friends, uh, that's just a few minutes 
of Erie, Pennsylvania history and the Marks Toy Works. This is your history guy, Tim McLaughlin. Thank you.